Good morning, and welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Grand Junction, Colorado. We're glad you're here today. We are an open, affirming, welcoming congregation, and to remind ourselves of that fact, we say together every Sunday morning, whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And so, wherever you are worshiping from, whether here in Grand Junction or somewhere else around the country, we hope you feel that welcome, and we hope you enjoy your worship with us this morning. Let us worship God. Join me in the call to worship this morning, and this one is based on Psalm 66. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip? For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you have brought us out in a spacious, beautiful place. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows. Those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. Come in here, all you who fear God, and I will tell what God has done for me. I cried aloud to God. God's praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. God has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God. Because God has not rejected my prayer or removed her steadfast love from me. I invite you to join in singing our first hymn, which is Let All Things Now Living.
Our first scripture lesson today is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And this is taken from the New Revised Standard Version. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And that concludes our scripture reading. You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak. Peter's first letter, the third chapter, 
And as Peter writes this passage and this letter, the situation for Christians at that time is somewhat tenuous. They were often harassed, sometimes actually persecuted for their faith. And so Peter gives them these words of advice. He says, so then, you must all have the same attitude and the same feelings as Christ. Love one another and be kind and humble to one another. Do not pay back evil with evil or cursing with cursing. Instead, pay back with a blessing because a blessing is what God has promised to give you when he called you. As the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and wish to see good times, you must keep from speaking evil and stop telling lies. You must turn away from evil and do good. You must strive for peace with all your heart. For the Lord watches over the righteous and listens to their prayers, but he opposes those who do evil. Who will you harm then if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Do not be afraid of anyone and do not be anxious, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor Christ as your Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that you have in Christ. But do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will become ashamed of what they say. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Good and gracious God, may the words that I speak, the thoughts and insights of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it seems as if, in some ways, the Christian church over the last 2,000 years has gone full circle. When Peter wrote this passage 2,000 years ago, the Christians were just this little splinter group off of Judaism. The Jews of those days were not all that highly respected. And the Christians, even less so. It was a time when they were approached with great skepticism. Indeed, a time when they were sometimes harassed and even at times persecuted for their faith. And so Peter gives them the advice that you just heard from his letter in the third chapter. He says, in effect, because of the situation in which you live, particularly because people are suspicious of who you are, it's imperative that you live an exemplary life, that you show a great example to all of those who are around you. So be good neighbors to everyone. Be gracious in your living. If someone abuses you, don't fight back. Don't punch back. Respond with love. As much as is possible, Peter says, live at peace with all so that no one can criticize your behavior. Indeed, so that people will be impressed, amazed by the lifestyle you live and may even wonder why you're living that way, what it's all about. Both of the passages that we read this morning, the passage that Karen read from Mark, the passage that I just read for you from 1 Peter, are making the same basic point to a church that is in living in a very difficult situation. 
They are both saying, in effect, you do not need to be ashamed of your faith. You do not need to be ashamed that you are a follower of Christ. You do not need to be ashamed to call yourself a Christian. Because of the times in which they lived, because they were so clearly countercultural, because people were almost naturally suspicious of them, it was important to remind them, you don't need to be ashamed of who you are. Now to you and me, living as we do in 21st century America, it seems strange that anyone would ever have to be told that. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, everybody was a Christian. Or at least so it seemed. The survey said that 95 to 98 percent of the population of America proclaimed themselves to be Christians, followers of Christ. And so we felt no need to defend ourselves. In fact, if anybody had to defend themselves, it was that small two or three or five percent of the population that didn't identify as Christian. In fact, we were quite proud, some of us, to say time and time again, we live in a Christian country. In fact, Christianity had become completely acculturated. Being an American and being a Christian seemed almost the same thing, almost indistinguishable. Ironically, one of the differences was that all too often the Christians had gone from those who were persecuted to those who were doing the persecuting. The term Christian in our culture today has been hijacked. We have white supremacists who fly the Christian flag right along with the American flag as they are proponents of violence and of bigotry. We have racists in our country who burn the cross, turning it into a symbol of hatred and violence rather than compassion and forgiveness. And they call themselves Christian. We have Christian pastors across the country who spew out hatred and judgment against gay and lesbian people and call themselves Christian. We have well-known, famous Christian evangelists who defend our president when he separates immigrant children from their parents and puts the parents and the children in separate cages and they call themselves Christian. I have to admit to you that sometimes I am ashamed to call myself a Christian. I get weary of defending what I consider to be the true Christian faith. I get tired of trying to explain to people that not all Christians hate gays and lesbians or immigrants or people of color or the poor. I get tired of trying to help people understand what it really means to walk in the way of Jesus. And so, I think, in this sense, we have come 
360. We are back to where Peter was 2,000 years ago, trying to help people understand in a culture that was not sympathetic what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. The non-Christians in our culture look at the racists and the white supremacists and the bigots and they say, understandably, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want any part of it. And so with every passing year in America, we have fewer people who identify as Christian and more people who identify as nons, those who practice no faith. And it's not a surprise. Given the reputation that Christianity has taken on in our culture. And so we should go back to the words of Peter. To his admonition that the best way to counteract that. The best way to be an example is through our actions, through the ways that we live. When we go to Homeward Bound, folks, and we serve a meal there to the people who need it, we are witnessing to our faith. When we go down to City Hall and advocate for a resolution of equality for all human beings, we are testifying to our faith. When we sign up to have a float in the Gay Pride Parade that proclaims to everyone God's doors are open to all, we are testifying to our Christian faith. When we participate in ShareFest, and we help an elderly woman take care of her yard or wash her windows, we're testifying to our faith. When we sign up to deliver meals for Meals on Wheels, or we cook a homemade meal for a friend or a neighbor who's struggling, we are testifying to our Christian faith. But then Peter says this one last thing. When you do those things, be ready. And should someone be surprised or amazed or mystified by your generosity or by your compassion or by your unselfishness or by your servant lifestyle and should ask you why you live the way you live, be ready. Be ready to talk about the way of Jesus and the difference that has made for you. When it comes to this whole matter of being a witness and what it means to witness, I think perhaps the best explanation ever came from St. Francis of Assisi, that 13th century friar monk who said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
As we have been blessed by worship and by God's word, we now take time to give thanks to God. And we do that by the giving and receiving of offerings. And so now as you worship in your homes, we invite you to take this moment to reflect on the many ways in which God has blessed you and to recommit yourself to God's service. We now receive our gifts and offerings. We 
do what we must do. And that is, we turn to you, O oh God, and we acknowledge our humanness, our frailty, our limitations. We confess with honest hearts that we are not God after all, that we need your help, your presence, your comfort, So be with us just this moment now, O oh God. In the silence of these moments, as we breathe deeply and pause, give us a sense of your presence, of your support, and of your love. Help us to remember the words of Scripture, that we can do all things, not in and of ourselves, but through Christ, who strengthens us. Help us to proclaim with Paul that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Neither life nor death, nor angels or principalities, things present or things to come, height nor depth, nor anything in all creation, including the coronavirus, can separate us from your love. Help us to know that, O oh God, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. And especially for those of us who are doing reasonably well. Help us to be instruments of your grace. To reach out to those who are hurting, who are anxious, who are demoralized. With a word of grace and hope, with a joke, with good humor, with a small gesture that lets someone know that they are cared about, that they are loved. We bring these prayers, O oh God, in the name of your Son, who invites us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
forth from this place to witness to the goodness and grace and love of God through words and deeds. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Creator, the power, presence, and comfort of God's Spirit be with you this day and every day. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.